What's up, everybody? Welcome in. This is Diamond Bets. I'm Matt. He is Joe. This is all about baseball. For the next short while, we're going to take you through everything you need to know to pull a little from it and use it in your daily life. I'm talking about money, wagering, DFS, even season-long fantasy. Why not turn our love of baseball into something that we need? And something that we need, we have Mr. Joe Pizzapia, Diamond Bets. It just works. Welcome home, my friend. That's right, baby. I am back from vacation. A little tanner, uh, that's for sure. But uh, that's automatic for me. I step outside, boom, I'm just tan. But I never get to go outside because I'm always doing shows. But it was great to uh, to be out for the uh, the kiddos for a couple of days. We did the Universal Studios. It was very fun in Orlando. Coming back here, it's July Fourth weekend. We have a baseball show on July Fourth. What's more American than that? I can't imagine. Maybe I'll eat a piece of apple pie while we're during the show talking about baseball on July Fourth weekend, wearing uh, the uh, the trunks from uh, <laughs> Apollo Creed. Like that's about as American wow, as I could possibly imagine. And who knows? <laughs> As the show goes on, maybe you'll see those boxers that I'm wearing. But let's get to the uh, the headlines. Let's go to what's going on around Major League Baseball right now. Let's start with Max Scherzer. That's the big news because it looks like Max Scherzer is going to be back on Tuesday. He made his rehab starts. We thought he might come back last week. That was not to be the case, unfortunately. It's a little bit longer for Max Scherzer. But once again, to me, it's more important that the guy comes back healthy. The Mets have been in a dogfight with the Braves for the last few weeks since he's been out. And Max Scherzer hasn't been good. He's been great, folks. When you're looking at uh, the record so far in the year over eight starts with the Mets, he's 5-1 and one with a 2.54 ERA and a .95 whip. Doesn't get much better than that. Uh, and then if you're looking around, you also got Jacob deGrom, who looks like he might be on his way back as well. He's going to make his first rehab start. They're targeting somewhere around mid-July, somewhere on the 18th of July. Looks like it's possible for him to come back if everything goes well and there's no setbacks. In the meantime, there was a setback in that Mets rotation because Chris Bassett, was placed on the IL. So again, the Mets always one step forward, one step back. Uh, Speaking of one step forward, one step back, Juan Soto continuing negotiations with the Nats says he's open to a deal potentially there. He's already turned down one deal reportedly, possibly two. We shall see how that all works out. And Tony Gonsolin cannot be stopped. He is now 10 and 0 after shutting out the Padres earlier this week. So Tony Gonsolin continues to be the rock of that Dodger rotation. Who thought that going into the season? Nobody, Matt Stryker, nobody. But let's start with Juan Soto, because that's the one to me that really stands out here. So Juan Soto, Matt, all-world talent, still very young, already has a World Series ring, very little to prove, one of the best players in baseball. Juan Soto is going to get paid no matter where he goes as soon as he hits the market. If you're Juan Soto when you look at the Nationals right now and you're trying to sign a long-term 10-plus year deal with the team, how are the Nationals selling themselves to Juan Soto? And I know that sounds like a crazy thing to say because they're offering him $300, $400 million potentially. But how do you sell this guy? Because right now the Nationals are a bad team and they don't necessarily have the best pipeline in baseball to be really good anytime soon. So what do you think about this whole situation with Juan Soto and the Nats? So I think it's uh, one of these things where I think Ted Williams said he always swung a lighter bat because it allowed him to wait longer. The longer you wait, the less you're fooled. When the Nats signed Nelson Cruz, this blurb came out. I think it came from Nelson Cruz's camp, for lack of a better term, that the Nats assured Cruz that they are going to build to a winner. As we welcome in our radio audience, this is Diamond Bets. My name's Matt. His name is Joe. We're talking baseball here, and we're looking at Juan Soto seems that Juan Soto could be this bubble ready to burst. Joe asked me the question about if you're the Nationals, how do you sell yourself to Juan Soto? I brought up how I was curious when the Nationals brought in Nelson Cruz, and now I think it all makes sense. I think the Nats brought in Nelson Cruz to somehow support their argument towards Soto. If they have money, that's going to matter more than not having the pipeline or anything else. You add two or three players to this team, and they can do that, and the league has changed enough where they can buy those pieces Next season, we could be talking about the Nationals. I just, I I don't see the door fully closed. I think Nelson Cruz helps the Nationals' argument. I don't know. Nelson Cruz is 147 (laughs) years old. And and, and look, I'm 145 and you're 144. So uh, clearly we know what we're talking about. Nelson Cruz, we all went to high school with, I feel like. But it's, it's, it's difficult for me when I look at this Juan Soto situation because to me, Juan Soto is now got 
basically he has this entire career ahead of him still, and he's already had a ton of accomplishments. So do I want to just take this big money here or do I want to take big money somewhere else where I'm going to be relevant every year? Because if you're Juan Soto, you have a chance not to be good. You have a chance to be all time great. And I think it's really hard to be all time great when you're on a team that struggles. I mean, Ernie Banks was on bad Cubs teams a lot of his career, right? There are some great players that spend most of their careers or all of it with bad teams. It's less likely nowadays. I just feel like if you're Juan Soto, you want to put yourself in a market where you can not only capitalize on your talent, but also the other marketing opportunities. If that's in a Chicago, a Los Angeles, a New York, one of those talents. It's not to say you can't do that in Washington. Of course you can, but it's not quite the same level of exposure. And we all know that to be true. It's just a fact. So I don't know. Juan Soto wants to be all-time great. He's got to be in more playoff games, I think. And I don't know. It's a real tough sell for me. And Strasburg, you're probably never going to get much out of him in that contract. That's going to be an albatross on that organization. So this is a tough spot here. It looks like, I think, personally, Juan might be going somewhere else. But we're just getting started here. We're not going anywhere else. When we come back, we're going to talk about what's trending in Major League Baseball. And yes, one of those things could be the Pirates. I said it. The Pirates. We'll be back right after this on Diamond Bets. Betting above the rim. What are your early thoughts on the Kevin Durant saga in Brooklyn? You know, this has been kind of his MO. When things don't go right, he goes the other way. But if you really think about what just went on with the Nets, it was just a mess. It was a mess all last year. I'm not surprised that this breakup has happened. Maybe the events happened in different orders, but the, the fact that this team is being broken up, not surprised one bit. Betting above the rim. The Bostonian versus the book. They're not going to know what hit them. Okay. These kids, this is a money grab in a really bad idea. You're telling me that these kids from Southern California Mm -hmm. are going to go to Happy Valley in December for a 9 a.m. kickoff. Mm -mm. The Bostonian versus the book. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. Sports professor Rick Carl wins the $1.3 trillion business of sports with your Sports News Minute analyzing the Formula One deal. Amazon ran hard on getting the rights to Formula One in the U.S. ESPN, ABC, ESPN Plus ran harder. $5 million rights fee extended and expanded to anywhere from 90 to 100 depending on what you're hearing. And the bottom line is this is going to be one of those mega promotional deals that ESPN does promote all over the U.S. and the world as they justify the expansion of Formula One. So at the end of the day, Formula One viewership up 36% this year. A huge deal. The ESPN deal will keep the momentum going. And Vegas, Miami, Austin, Montreal, and other cities all over North America, the presence with Formula One bigger than anybody might have expected. Sports professor Rick Carl, Sports News Minute. All 
All right, welcome back in. This is Diamond Vets. Yep, you found us. I'm Matt. He's Joe. We're talking everything you need to know about baseball. Looking ahead the coming week. Look at what's going on. Look at it for its entirety over the season. Maybe you play in a season long fantasy league. Maybe you're raking it in DFS. Maybe you're just out there betting on baseball. A lot of states have it now, and it's a great thing, I think. Joe, let's talk about what's trending because it definitely affects the markets, air quotes. Uh, begin mm. with uh, what you're seeing out there. Well, let's begin with Shohei Otani. And let's talk about that for a second, because when last we left you a few weeks ago, at least I did, you know, we had this whole discussion about how to approach the Shohei Otani market. And Aaron Judge was going crazy a few weeks ago, right? And we said Shohei Otani is going to slip back a little bit. And he got all the way to five to one. And then if you bet him again and reinvest at that point, that was the best time to get Otani because it probably wasn't going to go in the other direction further. And of course, he has a phenomenal week a phenomenal run here and he's right back in that conversation at two to one in most places and if you look at what he's done you know people have had an eight rbi game like otani did right okay babe ruth never did it aaron never did it barry bonds never did it pools never did it you look at this tweet here we have on the board and then there's pitchers that never had a 13 strikeout game lefty grove never did it jack morris tom glavin catfish under all hall of famers otani did both of these things in consecutive days Otani is carrying what's left of this Angels roster on his back, despite Mike Trout being there too. And I think he's reminding everybody how special he is, the two-way player, the lone wolf, as it were. And this guy is so special and such an extraordinary talent that if Aaron Judge should hit a long slump, Otani is going to be right back into this conversation. He basically is already from a number standpoint. Vegas thinks that as well. And if you're sitting there with a vote, I understand the vote for Aaron Judge. I get it. He's been brilliant. The Yankees have been fantastic. There's still a lot of baseball left to play. And as a Mets fan, I can tell you, I've seen a lot of leads disintegrate over time. It's something that happens, maybe less so with the Yankees than it is with the Mets. But at the same point, at what stage in this conversation do people pull back and say, well, Otani's a really good hitter and he's pitching. And that is always the argument. It's the argument coming into the season, Matt, that we talked about. Otani is this guy that the only reason he's three to one and not minus money going into the year for MVP in the American league is because of the injury risk of being a pitcher. That's it. It's the injury risk. It's not the identity of the player. It's not what he offers. It's sheerly the risk. And I think that is something once we get halfway into the season, people are less afraid of. And I think that is something right now that you're seeing in the market for Shohei Otani as that number continues to disintegrate over time and the judge number gets closer to Otani. But look, this run that he's been on these last few weeks, he's reminding everybody why he's the reigning MVP. And I think he's going to get back in this conversation. But I think, Matt, and maybe you agree or disagree, you might have missed the boat already to bet on Shohei Otani at a bigger number for MVP in the American League because I think that ship has sailed. A bigger number, sure, but baseball does move in ebbs and flows. But we approach the all-star break where things start to solidify, you know, at least thoughts, concepts, identities of teams. They show you who they are. Uh, I don't want to say it, but does Aaron Judge become this year's Vlad Guerrero? Or is Aaron Judge doing so much on such a public, popular team that it's just enough? But I've often maintained, we've discussed it here, that as long as Otani does both hit and pitch at any level of success, you cannot argue against the fact that he is most valuable. And it's a, a shame to see that that Angels team now tells you, whether it's Trout or Otani, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, th that, yeah and, you, and that you, is you true. I think the, the air come out of the room there, so. You, you're right. And Judge, you know, to me, because he plays for the Yankees, I think that is the difference maker. Because I, I will make a million arguments of why Jose Ramirez is just as worthy as Aaron sure, Judge. Absolutely. But the difference between There's Ramirez no and Judge is, is they don't pitch. And Shohei Otani yeah. is. And how valuable is that to a team? And look, the Angels are still under 500. That's the big difference. Cleveland is still three games over and the Yankees are, you know, the Yankees, <laughs> 58 wins. Let's get to uh, maybe a, a less public team. Let's talk about the Pirates. Now, I know Jack was very excited about this because the Pirates are uh, on a bit of a tear. Anyo Cruz brought up last week. He has been outstanding. Uh, he had another home run yesterday. Uh, certainly been fun. So here's the Pirates. Most RBI in the first six games of their major league career. Anyo Cruz up at 10 with, of course, Dick Stewart and Jack Merson in 1958 and 1951, respectively. 
once again, those guys, I think, also play with Nelson Cruz just to kind of tie everything together from the first segment. So uh, they've been around a long time. Uh, and look, Anyo Cruz certainly has been fun. Uh, Javis has had a pretty good season for them. Jack Sawinski's hitting for a lot of power. We'll talk about him in hour two. But this is what Pyre fans have been lacking, right? Excitement. They don't expect to win a lot of games. But I think the problem is, if you're a Pirates fan, you're frustrated at the beginning of the year because you're not seeing the future. And it's not about winning games. It's about, is there a better product on the field? And why is it that Torkelson and Bobby Witt and, and Julio Rodriguez are all starting with their team and Anil Cruz is starting in AAA? This was the argument. This is why people wanted to see him up here. Sure, there's going to be an adjustment period. But if you're a Pirates fan, at least it's exciting, Matt, that you're starting to see the future. Yeah, man. Hot summer in Pittsburgh. But you know, let, let me speak to the Pirate fan as a even-minded baseball fan, or I like to think so. First and foremost, yeah, it's great to be excited. Joe mentioned all the bats, and he mentioned how you could just be excited about having a better product on the field. I think you'd be excited for more. I think that division is ripe for the picking. You look at that division and the way it's structured, and look at the top, let them vulture themselves. Boom, there the Pirates are looking at some type of postseason uh, representation. And I'm not saying it's happening this year, but you can start to think this way. As far as this year goes, now do you hold on to Quintana? I mean, Brubaker, I, I don't, he hasn't been wagerable, and I don't think he's just very good, and I don't like to speak in definites, but that's just how it is. Mitch Keller as well. What do you get for this and bring it back? And now what does your Pirates team look like? Because guys like Castillo, Reynolds has to stay but this type, this team is starting to look like something you can say, hey, you have an identity now. I can get behind you. Pitching is still a big deal. So that's what I offer mm -hmm. to the even-minded Pirate fan, Joe. It's, it's time to be excited. And as a wagerer, it's time to be excited. These total base props are moving in, plus 125 on a lot of players. When right. you start to look at them and you start to find different ways, DFS as well. This is now a fun team where people are going to be aware. So Pirate fans, welcome in the public. Yeah, I don't think they're quite aware yet, especially on the DFS side, but you're right. It's it's going to be uh, – the awareness is going to come quickly. And you're right, if only they had the pitching. Uh, and I would point to if only they still had Joe Musgrove or Tyler Glass now or Shane Boz or any of those guys that came through the organization in the last five years that they didn't hold on to or couldn't get right. What a, what a sad state of affairs that is. But let's talk about a happy state of affairs when it comes to Dylan Cease, who's been the guy who's holding that rotation together – Got another win yesterday after giving up a home run in the first hitter of the game. He settled in nicely. But Dylan Cease of the White Sox, pitcher of the month, by the way, in June, is the first American League pitcher to have five consecutive starts with five-plus strikeouts and no earned runs allowed since earned runs became an official stat in 1913. Uh, Dylan Cease this season has been the guy that we thought Giolito was going to be. Giolito has not been that dude. We're still trying to figure out why none of us seem to know the answer, but in 16 starts so far, the guy's 7-3, and 2-5-1 ERA, a 1.24 whip, 125 strikeouts, Matt, in 86 innings. That is an incredible K per nine rate. Dylan Cease has been dominant. Dylan Cease has been the most valuable player for this White Sox team, in my opinion. What are your thoughts? Uh, outs props and K props for Dylan Cease have been the way that I think people have been raking in. Not really, because sometimes you, you see some places will have a K prop at 7.5, and then you see it's someplace has it at six. And that's a huge number there. You mentioned five or more. No earned runs allowed. And the first guy to do it since you were 10 years old. Uh, but it's fun. It's fun to wager on. It's fun to take that. And then the problem I've been having, though, and maybe people out there will hit us up at SportsGrid, at SportsGrid TV, is what do you do with the bats? What do you do with the White Sox bats? I want to get behind the team as a unit collectively. But Cease is easy to get behind. The rest of it, not so much, Joe. Well, we are officially at the halfway point just about after this weekend's games. And I think that's the perfect time to start looking again at the markets for AL winner, NL pennant, and of course, the World Series. When we come back. We're going to do that here, here on Diamond Bet. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. If you want to pick like a pro, you need to be in the know. The future of sports gaming is now, and we take you inside the lines, breaking down all the action and what it means for your bet slip. Turn down the game and tune into Sports Grid Radio. Other networks talk sports talk, but we walk the walk right up to the window. 
Sports Grid Radio. Listen free on the Sports Grid Radio app, iHeart, or TuneIn, or catch us on Sirius XM Sports Grid Channel 159. The early line. For two Pac-12 teams on the West Coast to be in the Big Ten, it doesn't even compute or make any sense until you remember it's about the almighty dollar. So now, where does that leave the Pac-12 at this point? Your two flagship programs now are in the Big Ten. You're going to fold up. There is no more Power Five. We are at best a power four. At best, at best a power four. Because the Pac-12 is done. Only on SportsGrid. The morning after. The Big Ten was looking at deals that would pay them out $1.1 billion with a B on an annual basis. That was before USC and UCLA joined the conference for 2024 yesterday. And I think it could potentially top $3 billion. I really believe that once we get started in 2024, Ben, because you're talking about some of the most recognizable names in terms of the sport. The Sports Grid Network. You might be the next Daily Fantasy Millionaire. No matter what you watch or where you play, learn from the world's best DFS players. Lineup building tools, expert projections, and advanced stats change the way you play the game. Dominate the competition. DailyRoto.com, the player's choice. Betting above the rim. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start doing the John Wall right now. Remember, the, remember when the John Wall was big back in the day? Can, can, can you get the coach Young, please? Like, John you got that that graphic. John, John, you know, John. Wall. You got the little John, John Wall. You got the little John Wall going. If if John Wall is is ready to go, and Kawhi is engaged, you could argue that the L.A. Clippers have the most depth in the NBA. Betting above the rim. All right, welcome back in. This is Diamond Bets. Matt and Joe with you here for a short little while longer. Keep us in your pocket as well at SportsGrid, at SportsGrid TV. And Joe, I couldn't help but hear my New Yorkness come out with you here. Joe, of course, a native of Brooklyn. And uh, I think it's always fun, no matter where you're from, no matter how old you are, to sit around at this point in the season and look at the standings and say, oh, this team could do something. Ah, this team's out of it. Oh, look, if this team wins this many more games. And now with expanded playoffs, it's even more fun. So uh, let's move between the lines. Let's talk about the NL and the AL. Uh, Joe, what's jumping out at you? And who are the, ooh, this teams could do something? Well, usually when you sit here at the halfway point in the season, which is where we're at right now, the all-star break is always after, you know, people forget that. This is the halfway. We're just around 80, 81 games, depending on the team, what's going on here after today's games. And I think it's important to step back and evaluate and say, okay, what did we think was going to be the case? What has surprised us? And I think if you look at the National League, it's sort of right where we thought it would be, right? You see the Dodgers still up at the top to win the National League pennant at plus 220. You see the New York Mets at plus 350. The Atlanta Braves at plus 600, which I'm actually a little surprised that number is not more like four and a half or five personally, uh, but I understand why. Uh, they still have some young pitching there too, and Kyle Wright's been a little less spectacular over the last month than he was in the first two. San Diego Padres are still right around there, plus 600. That was our team coming in. Now that has reduced significantly. The Padres were probably around 10 to one or something like that, or eight to one, depending on the betting house to start the year. So that number has moved considerably. So that's slightly surprising to most people, but not to us because we were very much in on the Padres to start the season. Then you have the Brewers and the Cardinals here. The Brewers are plus 850. Vegas has still been very true to Milwaukee, which is fascinating to me that they haven't uh, gone for the more public St. Louis Cardinals, but the Cardinals at plus 1200. So 
I think we expect these six teams to be in the playoffs, right? I think we can probably most likely barring catastrophe lock these six teams in, especially because some of the bottom feeder teams in the central and the West and the East are, you know, bottom feeding teams at the end of the day. And they're going to probably continue to jettison pieces as we get closer to the trade deadline. I still have a tough time going for the Dodgers. I don't know why. And, you know, I've always said you can't make money on the Dodgers this year, really. You can. You can make plus 220, but it's not nearly as sexy as betting on, say, the Atlanta Braves or the Padres. And I keep coming down to some of these other teams because, once again, this is not about best record. This is not about winning divisions. This is about winning the National League. And this is about a short series. So if Scherzer and DeGrom pitch better, or pitch at all, <laughs> or are healthy in the second mm -hmm. half, right? If those guys are there and they get to the playoffs healthy, right? This New York Mets number, I don't think is going to stick at 350. This is the one to me that might move the most potentially either way. Now, it's a risk because DeGrom could come back, pitch for four starts, get hurt again and be out. And this number all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden becomes a lot less tempting than the three and a half that you invested in. But if Scherzer comes back, if DeGrom comes back, they pitch very well. They dominate the East in the second half of the season. This plus 350 could get a lot closer to this two to one. And I kind of wonder if the Mets are the most volatile and interesting wager on the board. I think you make the most money potentially on the Braves or the Padres because those teams, you know, especially the Braves know how to win. Everyone remember the Padres are going to get Tatis Jr. back sooner than later. But Matt, to me, it's all these other teams and not the Dodgers that really have my wagering eye. How about you, my friend? Yeah, you said so many important things there. The, the first thing was a short series. So you and I have talked mm -hmm. about this at length. It's all about your one, two, three, and what can you throw at me? And the Grom Scherzer, that's what it's about. But removing that, the, the Mets will still be there. So, so what did they, did they do? So I think this number is a fair number because you play at both sides. If Scherzer and DeGrom come back, hey, look, I got it at this number. If they don't or they're not what they're supposed to be, hey, I got it at this number. The Braves also, though, you got to remember, Soroka could come back here and could really mean something to this ball club. And if he does, does that mean that Anderson goes to the pen? Like, what does it mean? They know, they being the Braves, know how to win. They know what it means to win these games. That's the thing with the Dodgers here. People are like, oh, you know, you've seen them lose games. Yeah, they're losing games in June and July. It's fine. They know how to win the games that matter. We see it in other sports, too, especially in hockey and Stanley Cup. Not so much this season, but teams know how to win the games that matter. San Diego is very interesting because they can throw several different teams at you, uh, players, pitchers, high, in a short series. Plus the potential of having Tatis backs make, makes them even more dangerous. The Cardinals, I want to say, have enough weapons. Their bullpen, if it can just get right, poses a real threat. So yeah, man, the short series approach is really the thought process you have to have here. But I can't get my mind away from that Met number being a fair number, which is something you don't often yeah. hear me say. We see a lot. And that Braves <laughs> number is the value number. Yeah, the Met number is fair, but it absolutely has the most volatility in it. There's no doubt about that mm -hmm. in my mind. I mean, this number could become six or seven or eight if both of those older pitchers don't end up looking like themselves in July and August, all of a sudden if they're back on the IL. And the Dodgers, you know, keep coming back to the Dodgers too, because yeah, Tony Gonsolin's 10-0, and yeah, Anderson threw a good game yesterday again. But I mean, it's still another 81 games left, and there's still a lot of innings left, and then you're going to put October innings on top of that, and I just, history tells us that is a dangerous game to play. Uh, in the American League, everything seems a little less dangerous. Uh, the Yankees are still the favorite at plus 175, but I think the Houston Astros kind of, you know, showed you, that, hey, we're going to be there with you. Uh, we're right there with their plus 250. And, uh, you know, hitting is great, but momentum is only as good as the next day starting pitcher. And when you've got, you know, Justin Verlander and you've got those kind of guys that are battle tested, I feel like that is important. And uh, on any given night, the Astros are going to throw a good starter out. Not that the Yankees aren't. The Yankees have been excellent. Cortez has been great. Cole with another good start yesterday. Uh, the Blue Jays making a statement offensively. It was like the Blue Jays offense starting to wake up a little bit. So that's a good thing. Certainly been waiting for that. I can see the Blue Jays having a great second half and really turning on the uh, turbo boosters here in the last 81 games after scuffling. But they need to get that three spot in the rotation nailed down. Jose Barrios is not the answer. I'm sorry. Like enough with the back and forth and the yo-yo starts. I can't handle that anymore. I'm sure the Blue Jays can't either. Then you have the Red Sox at plus 1,200 who have – 
to their credit, really battled. We'll see what Chris Sale has left in the tank as he continues to work his way back. The Tampa Rays are never going away at 13 to 1. They are always a fascinating team. They're going to get a little pitching healthy as well. And then the White Sox, which, you know, the White Sox are my team going into this year at plus 1,500. I mean, you know, you could put them in the, in the Cleveland Guardians in that same conversation. I don't see any of these teams from the Central competing with the Astros or the Yankees. So to me, it does come down to these two teams. With the one caveat, the fun wager is still the Rays because they're getting Wander Franco back next week. They pulled off a trade last year for Nelson Cruz. They could pull off a trade for another bat here at any given moment in July solidify that offense a little bit more with some more lineup protection and they're right in this conversation but Astros and Yankees those are the two teams at the top it kind of feels like one of those two teams but Matt how do you see this board perhaps it's different than I do no it's not and it's a fair assessment it is Yankees and Astros up front and then to your point <clears throat> and I agree if the Rays get in in any way shape or form back to that whole Dodger theory they, being the Rays, know how to win in the postseason. And there are arms out there. I mean, Montas is going to go. I did mention Quintana. Molly may go. Castillo may go. Uh, both guys from Cincinnati. So you have to envision these teams with, with those players in, in some form. Um, the White Sox thing, I almost want to say throw out the White Sox and, and maybe move the Twins and the Guardians into this conversation, especially with all the, the trade pieces that could come out there. Short series. Remember, we talked about it for the NL. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies here for the AL. But um, foregone conclusions are hard especially in wagering because you want to find that that tampa number what is that plus 1300 i mean my eyes are failing me at this point in my life but yeah <laughs> you want to find the team that knows how to win tampa could be that team yeah these are the numbers we're using by the way from fandle just to be clear uh and look if you're looking at the world series odds right now you still have the Yankees at the top at plus 400 the dodgers at plus 450 the very public teams i think there's a really good chance you see uh, neither of these two teams in the World Series at the end of the day. It's because a lot of times, you know, teams that are great in the regular season, they peak a little early. You want that team that sort of peaks at the right time uh, and plays their best baseball in the second half of the season, which is why I think it's very possible that you could get the Mets at plus 700 here as that team. Because although they played like gangbusters in the first two months, they really haven't been quite as dominant. They've been a little bit more human. You've seen the Braves close that gap. But short series, there is no team in Major League Baseball that has two starters as good as DeGrom and Scherzer, if indeed they're healthy. Sure. That is something that is very difficult because you're looking at five games between those two starters you're going to have to go through, right? Especially, you know Scherzer is going to take the ball in three days rest. You know he's going to. The Astros at plus 600 to me, that's where I want to put my wagers. The Astros at plus six, the Mets at plus 700. To me, those are the right in that sweet spot of I like the teams. I think they both got something to prove and that makes them dangerous. But Matt, how do you see these odds for the World Series shaking out for yourself? Well, you make a good argument, man. Short series, nobody can stand up to the Mets 1, 2, 3. I think teams that can challenge and piece together some type of resistance, if not victory, would be Houston, would be Atlanta, would be San Diego. If Milwaukee were healthy mm -hmm. come the time, it would be them, but let's move them out. So those are the teams that you would throw some portions of a unit on. And if the Blue Jays acquire some arms, Again, we have to imagine these teams as what they could be, not so much as what they are, and that's what the wager is upon. That's why it's a future. Uh, I think they would be good as well. As I think that's yeah, 13 to 1. I wonder if the Blue Jays had held on to Robbie Ray and added Kevin Gossman, where they'd be right now. That That's something to me that I, I wonder about. I know that's a lot of money. I know they paid Kevin Gossman, but I... <sighs> To me, you had a moment there where you could have both of those guys, right, at the top of this rotation. And all of a sudden, that's a whole different conversation we're having about the Toronto Blue Jays. But hopefully they get involved in this. Hopefully they can really pick things up here in the second half and don't sleep on those Rays because that team knows how to play baseball and just kind of materialize runs. When we come back, we're going to talk about who's hot and who's not in Major League Baseball over the last two weeks. We'll tell you right here on Diamond. The Bostonian versus the book. So you've got LeBron, Westbrook, and Kevin Durant. <laughs> Sounds like a sitcom to me. 
it's, it's a disaster. Like a it's, it's, it's don't sound like a team that's going to win a championship. One basketball I, I and love... rolling cameras, basically, is what that is. Please. Just, like, show I me might every... buy, I might buy Lakers season tickets if that's a game. The Bostonian versus the book. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The morning after. How do you evaluate an individual award race like a one for the most valuable player? Uh, that's a great question because actually I've done some more kind of work on this overall, whether it be Cy Young Awards or MVP mm. Awards. One thing I like to work in because I'm a guy that was holding a pretty large ticket on Sandy Alcantara to win the NL Cy Young. The only problem is I bet it last year at uh, uh, 100 bucks to win 20000 The Sports Grid Network. Maurice Allen, 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? McAfee show. The AJ Brown deal was a massive one because you have a guy in his rookie deal, fourth year of the contract, getting that $25 million a year average extension, and now McLaurin jumps on that. If it was just Tyreek and Devontae, McLaurin couldn't have a case because those are veteran guys that have had more than their rookie deals. But AJ Brown really changed the game, and, and McLaurin's taking advantage of that one. The Sports Grid Network. Welcome back in. This is Diamond Bets. I'm Matt. He's Joe. We're diving deep into baseball. Right now, we're going to take a deep dive into studs and duds. And I think a lot of people pay attention because they want the waiver wire ads, so especially those season-long fantasy baseball players that know what the grind is like. But as far as the DFS, the wagering world goes as well. This is a who's hot and a who's not. And you have to ride trends and you have to ride waves. You have to be aware of who's good and who's not, who has good matchups. So, Joe, let's look at it. Studs and duds. Who's been jumping out at you lately? Well, the last two weeks, somebody at the Nationals actually is uh, jumping out. It's Josh Bell. Believe it or not, it's Josh Bell. Over his last 41 at-bats, he's got nine runs scored, hitting 463 with three dingers, seven ribbies, and a 1423 OPS. Now, Josh Bell is a player that can help a lot of contending teams. So, If the Nats are sellers, which they should be, theoretically, they should be dealing Nelson Cruz to anyone who will take him. They should be dealing Josh Bell as well. And when you're looking around the landscape, um, for me, the team that jumps out right away is actually the Milwaukee Brewers. That's the team to me that, you know, Rowdy Telez has had a good season, uh, had a really good early start of the season. There's no doubt about that. But Rowdy Telez, to me, is more of a DH profile guy, whereas Josh Bell, I think a better defensive first baseman too. I think that's the kind of bat they could really use in the middle of this order in Milwaukee. It would be good for his fantasy value also because it's a little bit more of a home run friendly environment for Josh Bell. Uh, Lots of other contending teams seem to have first base on lock pretty much. Uh, But that's the one team that really sticks out to me in particular because I think Milwaukee could use a little bit more offense. 
And Josh Bell, I don't think would cost all that much either. And I think you could probably get Josh Bell for some mid-level prospects, but then you run into that problem, right? You're selling Juan Soto on staying here forever and you're trading around pieces that are right there on the team currently. That is a little incongruous. That's a tough sell there for the Juan Soto camp. And all these camps we keep talking about, I want to have my own camp. Don't you want to have a camp? We should have a camp. No. We should have people. We don't have people. No, you don't want a camp. All right. No camps for Matt Stryker. But look, Josh Bell can help a contending team. He right now is on a tear. Where would you put Josh Bell? Would you stick him on the national still? Or do you think a contender comes and says, hey, let's take this piece away and let's pluck him off there and see what he can do for us? I know the rule in improv is yes, and, and I know it drove me a while. I was like, no, you're like, I right, find out this guy. But I'll here's be cold the thing. in my tracks. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's just it's like shot to the oh my God, look, it's an alien. <laughs> no, nope. no, it's not. Okay, it's not an alien. I'll have to come up with something else now. No, you won't. Um, here's the thing. Imagine <laughs> Juan Soto got with Nat's management and said, listen, at some point in the season, we're going to deal Cruz and, and now Josh Bell to the team with the best farm system. Insert team here. And we're going to pull this haul of young. Who's the next guys that are coming up? Maybe that's the plan. I mean, I know I'm speculating and it's fun to do, but it, it, Bell is, is playing well and that's fine. You need to take advantage of it. A lot of times we talk about these star players, especially at positions. We want to get to these lesser known to the public players. If we move on to this next guy, we go to Toronto. I mean, I don't know how many people are aware of, A, the catcher situation going on there. And they got a guy that's going to come back uh, off the IL in a minute or two. They're the prospect that's up. And they have this guy that you want to talk about here. Three options potentially at catcher. That's unheard of. And a lot of fantasy players right now are just like shaking their head. Yes, yes. Talk to me about Alejandro Kirk. Yeah, the Toronto catcher, Alejandro Kirk, probably one of the unsung heroes of this offense that has been a little all over the place, I think, in the 2022 season, but starting to look better of late. And really a big part of it has been Kirk, uh, a fun player to watch too, more in the body type that I endorse than Matt Stryker probably. But uh, 40 at-bats over the last two weeks, 13 runs scored, 13 runs scored for a catcher. Uh, hitting 325, he can DH a little too, but he's got five home runs over that span, 10 ribbies. 1185 OPS. Uh, these are the kind of players that have been getting it done. Tejas Hernandez starting to get hot as well. But Kirk, like you said, you know, could get a little crowded there with Danny Jansen and, and the young catcher they have there as well, Montero. I think that you're looking at um, you're looking at the Blue Jays right now and saying they've got all the pieces. Uh, luckily, it looks like they dodged a bullet yesterday with Kevin Gossman taking a ball off his foot. Uh, the X-rays were negative. He had to leave that start early. But that's that's one piece. If you're the Blue Jays, you just cannot afford to lose right now is Kevin Gossman. But I think you're in a spot right now where you haven't played your best baseball. You're still in this. I think that, you know, all they need is to get that one other starting pitcher and the Montases and the Luis Castillos of the world are still out there. So if you're Toronto, go out there and be aggressive on those guys, get one of those pitchers in there, go make a run. Because if you do get into that short series in seven games or five games, anything can happen. And I think it's great when you're having offensive productivity from the catcher spot because there's a lot of teams that are just dead spots there and the yeah. the blue jays are not one of them i think we can all agree yeah most teams when you look at them from a dfs perspective actually from season-long fantasy and from baseball wagering to an extent the catcher position and you can't wager upon this is there as the mate to the battery for the pitcher and at some point someone will come up with a way to to monetize and, and quantify that you know the catcher did this and that's worth this many points we can talk about that at length but you speculated a what if what if toronto mm -hmm. still had this next guy robbie ray what if they still had him because what he's doing right now seattle mm -hmm. is the darling once again here they are you know so how do you figure robbie ray well, look, I've been saying for a month now to trade for Robbie Ray, because to me, you saw the ERA hovering above four and that's sort of unappealing to people when they look in their fantasy leagues. But if you look at what he's done over the last two weeks, over his last five starts here, you got 20 innings, right? 0.9 ERA, a 0.7 whip, 24 Ks, six walks. Uh, the guy's been unbelievably good, right? The guy's been incredible. Not to mention that he's also lowered that ERA is now at three, seven, eight. So, you know, a couple weeks ago, about a month ago, when his ERA over that span was about a three ERA, it was still above four on the year. And that's where you can really say, Hey, you know, I'm going to buy low on Robbie Ray somewhere. 
but the strikeout rate's always going to be high. He's still at 105 Ks uh, on the year in 97 innings. It's still above K per nine, which is where you want Robbie Ray to be. Um, you know, I think there was just a little bit of pressure on Robbie Ray signing the big contract, trying to be the guy. Uh, and I think put too much pressure on himself in April and May, or maybe it was that weird start to the season, which affected, I think, a couple pitchers. I think it affected Garrett Cole. I think it affected a few guys. It might have affected Robbie Ray, too. These guys are creatures of habit. But Robbie Ray showed you last year he is Cy Young material, right? You want to throw that away on on one bad six-game or eight-game stretch? To me, no. I don't want to do that. And if you go to the last eight games as opposed to the first eight, this is the Robbie Ray you saw last year. So I'm all in on Robbie Ray. I think the window is closed, unfortunately. But you can still make money with Robbie Ray. You can still look at the K props uh, in individual circumstances. You probably can't make trades for him right now in fantasy leagues, but you could still use him in DFS. But to me, Robbie Ray is that one piece that you could still look to and feel good about and feel like, you know, if you are the Seattle Mariners and you mentioned it, you know, there's still 13 games behind the Houston Astros, but they're getting closer to 500. They're just four games under 500 right now. They could certainly have a run in them. And Robbie Ray would be a big reason for that. Uh, he's not going to be a trade chip. He's not going to get moved on from. But it's unfortunate that people miss these windows sometimes to buy these players in their fantasy leagues because whenever you have a player that's on a good stretch, that's got a bit of a track record, especially coming off a Cy Young season, that's the time to take a shot on somebody while their ERA on the season is still higher than it is in a short window of time. But alas, that window is closed right now. But Robbie Ray looks a little bit more like Robbie Ray from last year. I think you'd agree. We got an alas on a baseball show. Mm. That to me is yes. a big win. I'm, I'm taking third head first on that one, my friend. Only you, and I love it. Um, but yeah, we talked about it, how at this point in the season, the cement begins to dry. And it's concerning when we see players that are starting to go the other way, starting to slump here, because then the hope is, oh, okay, well, you're gonna get hot when it matters, because that's really the only thing left. Uh, looking at the Dodgers right now, I think that they need help. They need guys to be healthy. And uh, Chris Taylor is, is, I don't think he's helping his cause, but maybe you can defend him. I can't, but you know, like whenever things are going poorly and then something else, like you just can't get out of your own way. Yesterday he fouled a ball off of his foot. I um, mean, he had, it was just, you know, just like sometimes it goes from bad to worse. And for Chris Taylor, he's in one of those stretches right now where nothing's working out. You know, it's just uh, Murphy's law, I guess, if you will. Over his last 48 at bats, sitting the buck 88, no homers, 19 strikeouts. The OBP is 250. The OPS is 521. I mean, that those are not good numbers. They're terrible. Um, but luckily, the Dodgers continue to win games and they're getting Mookie bets back today, it looks like. So that's a big win for them. But, you know, if you're the Dodgers, you need all these guys to contribute at the end of the day. Uh, Freddie Freeman's been excellent instead uh, of Mookie Betts' injury. That's what you signed Freddie Freeman for. But Chris Taylor is one of these important pieces, and you want this guy to get right. It seems like they can't get everybody right at the same time. It's like you get Mookie Betts going, and then he goes on the IL. And then, you know, Cody Bellinger and Justin Turner don't hit for a while, and then they start to, and then Chris Taylor falls off. It's kind of been the story. But the nice part about that story is the Dodgers are deep enough that they don't need everybody to be good all at the same time. But Chris Taylor, I think, is one of those pieces, Matt, that is more important than people realize. And I think he might need a couple of days off. So maybe, maybe the foul ball off the foot. Might be the best thing. Take a Sunday off, relax, reset your brain, and hopefully come back next week ready to go. What do you think? There you go. Seen it with a silver lining, right? I tell you, there are no problems, only solutions. I think John Lennon said that. <laughs> um, we were talking about how important pitching is in short series. Let's move to Atlanta now. And I talked about maybe moving this kid to the bullpen once a certain arm returns from the IL. But talk to me about mm -hmm. what's going on in Atlanta and Ian Anderson as of late. Yeah, Ian Anderson over his last three starts, not been good. Uh, 782 ERA over those 12 innings. Uh, again, the 12 innings, probably the biggest problem there. You can't be averaging four innings a start. Uh, and this is one of the problems I think the Braves have. I mean, pinning your hopes to Mike Soroka coming back, who hasn't pitched in two seasons, is asking a lot. Um, you know, asking Kyle Wright to be the same guy in the first 81 games that he, you know, is going to be in the next 81 is a lot. Uh, Charlie Morton is an older pitcher starting to show some signs of life recently, which is good. I think the Braves could use some pitching help. Um, again, 13 strikeouts for Ian Anderson, seven walks over that span. So the strikeout numbers are still kind of there. The problem is he's been very hit around the ballpark, 16 hits over those 12 innings. So it's a bad combination. Uh, sometimes just bad stretches. Sometimes guys go through this and that's fair. 
But I think when the Atlanta Braves, it feels like there was a window there without Scherzer for the Mets and without DeGrom where they could close the gap. And they did. I mean, I think it was like a 10 game lead. And now it's like, you know, mm-hmm. basically they cut that in half, which is great. That's probably what you need to do. But was it enough? I guess, Matt, that's my question. Did the Braves do enough in this window of time before all these Mets pitchers are back theoretically healthy by the all-star break time? Did the Braves close the gap enough in your opinion? Well, that's what makes it fun, isn't it? That's what we're all wagering on. It's called gambling for a reason. <laughs> You're gambling <laughs> on that, right? So ding, ding, ding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's this is going to be the, the, the test for everything. You mentioned Soroka coming back and if Wright's going to be the next guy and all this and all that. Maybe Morton's been holding back a little. Veteran player knows, hey, man, long season. Once we get to July and August, don't worry, guys, I'll turn it on. Fine, fair enough. That's what makes the race fun, and that's what makes the, the futures wagers a lot of fun. But from Anderson's perspective, you want him to get right because you want the entire rotation. We don't see it anymore. Find me a team that can give you four. I'm not even asking for five anymore. Give me four solid guys that go out there every single day to make up a rotation. It's hard to find that in baseball. That's changing now. So Anderson can find a place in this changing game. But for the Braves, what do they do? I don't know. You know. Anderson over his last three starts is a seven ERA. Kyle Wright has an ERA almost at five. Spencer Strider, very high ERA over the last few starts. We'll see. We come back. History lesson time right here on Diamond Bets. The Bostonian versus the book. So you've got LeBron, Westbrook, and Kevin Durant. <laughs> sounds like a sitcom to me. It's a disaster. Like a it's, it's, it's it does just, sound like a team that's going to win a championship. One basketball I, I love, and rolling cameras, basically, is what that is. Please. Just, like, show I me might buy, I might buy Lakers season tickets if that's a game. The Bostonian versus the book. The early line. USC and UCLA going to the Big Ten? Yes, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever on the face of it. How could you have two teams on the West Coast playing the Heartland, playing against, you know, in Chicago against Northwestern, or playing Ohio State in Columbus, or going up to Ann Arbor and playing Michigan, or East Lansing with Michigan State? It's going to happen here. Why? Because money dictates here. Only on Sports Grid. Betting above the rim. But you, at least for Utah, we've talked about it. The, that run is done. Those guys are leaving. Quinn Snyder is gone. You know, obviously the first domino is Gobert. I don't care what anybody says. Teams are calling on Donovan Mitchell. He should be moved. Mike Conley should be moved. And if I am Utah, I'm trying to get as many picks as possible because I have to almost restart the entire franchise. Betting above the rim. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best slips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's Game Time Decisions, only on SportsGrid. All 
right, welcome back into Diamond Bats, your weekly deep dive into Major League Baseball. My name's Matt, his name is Joe, and at this point, at the end of the hour, we jump in our way back machine, and Joe Pizzapia takes us through time. So where are we going, my friend? That was, that was a very nice Casey Kasem-esque opening there. Oh, thank I was you. Like, oh, I'm going to reach for the stuff. Hey, welcome back to Diamond Bats. Here's a letter I've got from, uh, from the past. Dear Joe and Matt, <laughs> love the show. Uh, <laughs> but yes, in honor of July 4th weekend, we thought we'd uh, take a trip back in the Wayback Machine all the way to 1983 and talk about some fireworks, some explosions. How about the most explosive inning ever? The Rangers exploded for 12 runs in the 15th inning, mind you. Imagine getting all the way to the 15th inning in a tie game and then you give up 12 and runs. Mind you. That to me is the epitome of just want to give up and you hate life and it's just over and you're done. They end up winning this game 16-4. to four. That ends up being the, the game over the A's, setting a new major league record for runs in a single extra inning. So there you have it, Matt. So can you imagine getting to a point here where you are uh, tied 2-2 going into the 15th inning? And then uh, the other team scores 12 runs in one inning. That's got to hurt, Matt. That's got to hurt. I want to know the people that stayed for all 12 <laughs> runs till the very end. This is what I need to know. That uh, 83 team, I looked it up, though. I think uh, was it was a Larry Parrish hit about nearly 30. Oh, Maybe wow. like 26. Larry runs. Parrish. Bell was on that team. Yeah. Fun. Fun stuff. Good fact. 80. Rangers talk right here on Diamond Bets today. And, and I got to tell you, I imagine more people stayed than you realize if there was a fireworks show after, right? I mean, that's the thing. I remember that game back in, was it 86? With the Mets and the, was it 85 or 86 with the Mets and the Braves where it went something like 20 innings, but everybody stayed because they wanted to see the fireworks. <laughs> and at the, the end, it was like 3 o'clock in the morning and the fireworks are going off and people were complaining in the area that what <laughs> explosions were happening. So <laughs> there you have it, folks. There you have it. So uh, that's uh, that's your little firework explosion here on Diamond Bets Hour 2, just around the corner. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Sports Group. <laughs> 